the people's platform it has been said that international relations are not only about diplomacy and power struggles they are also about the human condition about human needs and the aspiration of a better life good evening and welcome to the people's platform sri lanka and the united states of america linked through engagement across sectors marks 75 years of bilateral diplomatic relations it is in this backdrop that i am most pleased to welcome to the news first studio us ambassador to sri lanka julie chang ambassador chang good evening and welcome good evening thank you sonali for having me absolutely um ambassador the current unique disposition of sri lanka means that it has to work through combating an economic crisis being uh, in an imf uh, supported program as well as prioritizing debt restructuring so it has a tight rope to walk on and it looks at the international community for trade investment and support as we are celebrating 75 years of relations between um US and Sri Lanka US is Sri Lanka's number one export market as well to set the stage to this conversation um what does the paradigm of connection look like between the two countries Well if you look at the 75 years of our deep relationship it's it spans through so many issues so many areas and so many opportunities and that's why we have moved from um, a point of crisis last year here in Sri Lanka and during the height of the economic crisis to today that crisis did not happen overnight that means the solutions won't happen overnight so we're here to partner support and help Sri Lanka to get through the recovery and prosper in a sustainable way as you noted we are Sri Lanka's largest export market its recovery will depend on its exports continuing to boom and productivity to increase in addition to that we've given over 270 million dollars in humanitarian assistance in the past year that provided fertilizer to every paddy farmer provided school lunches to millions of school children provided loans to SMEs which are the backbone of this country to help to get them back on their feet mm -hmm. and just today we announced through the development finance corporation almost half a billion dollars in new financing that will support the west container terminal that i hope brings that uh, opportunity for more jobs local based solutions and to really develop sri lanka's economy through its recovery and beyond fantastic um you have always advocated for multi stakeholder participation and uh, discussion um you were in conversation with uh, a multitude of sri lankan stakeholders from policy makers uh, to uh, the lawyers collective to other uh, key stakeholders um of sri lanka's economy how has uh, these uh, this discussion range been Well, I think it's important for me as an ambassador, as a foreigner, to not just sit in my office in Colombo and read the newspapers, but go out and meet with everybody from all walks of life and beyond Colombo as well. So I've met with different party, political party leaders, farmers, teachers, students. I've traveled around the country to hear firsthand uh, what their views are, what their perspectives are. That helps me to get a better understanding of what Sri Lanka is in the current stage. and explain that to Washington and to engage better with all stakeholders. I think that communication is important at all levels. The UN human rights chief said that impunity for human rights abuses, economic crimes and corruption was the underlying reason for Sri Lanka's uh, collapse. The IMF uh, diagnostic governance report which was recently uh, released also alludes to this and talks about the deeply entrenched culture of corruption in Sri Lanka. How do you view this? Well, this is where economic reforms, economic governance and democratic governance go hand in hand. They can't be exclusive. And that's when you look at the root causes of some of the economic problems, it goes back to basic governance. I'm glad to see the IMF diagnostics report talk about the various governance issues, transparency, anti-corruption, and not just the IMF. There is a civil society collective that has also been coming together to talk about what Sri Lanka needs to do. It's mm -hmm. not just what the IMF prescribes or the international community. What do the Sri Lankan people, its civil society, its business leaders, its government want so that it doesn't go back into the same bad habits that got into the crises uh, of last year. So to really get, go into a sustainable, uh, long-term inclusive growth 
um, that governance piece is so essential. And we're happy to see that some of the basic laws have been passed recently, the anti-corruption bill, uh, the central bank bill, petroleum act, all those things are essential, but it goes beyond getting the bills passed to actual implementation. Next month also marks 75 years since the signing of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. How important is it to prioritize uh, the protection of rights such as freedom of expression in a democracy uh, like Sri Lanka? It's essential in any democracy. Sri Lanka is Asia's oldest democracy. We are a democracy. The freedom of expression, to be able to vote, to be able to express yourself freely for peaceful protest, all those are, are essential foundations of any democracy. And we hope that those things continue to be honored here in Sri Lanka. Ambassador Chung, you are quite active on Twitter, uh, recently speaking on the online safety bill. Uh, you said that preserving freedom of expression is essential. It's a fundamental right that is non-negotiable and must be safeguarded. Sri Lankans deserve fundamental freedoms. Just yesterday, uh, the Center of Policy Alternatives um, said that the CPA is deeply concerned with the proposed committee stage amendments that could drastically change the online safety bill uh, initially gazetted straying from its original merits and principles. Um, Ambassador, lawmaking is in the realm of parliament which is meant to represent the aspirations of the citizens of Sri Lanka. If there is a worry among the larger public that um, there is a risk that legislation or proposed legislation uh, may be used by the state to um, weaponize uh, against the people. How do you think the people must respond to enable rights protection? Well, that's exactly not right. It's not about what I think or the United States thinks or other foreign countries think. If you hear the resounding feedback uh, from civil society, from the private sector, from tech companies, um, everybody across a wide range of stakeholders in the country have expressed concerns about this online safety bill. Now, of course, there's a need for to address the issues of online violence against women and children. We understand that there are harms and there are risks that are involved online. However, is this the right bill to address those uh, issues critically? Can those be issued addressed uh, surgically instead of a broad-based bill that goes beyond what people in the, in the in public want uh, to ensure that the freedom of expression is preserved while addressing the online crimes that are legitimate concerns out there. What steps must the government of Sri Lanka take in ensuring and enabling rights protection in Sri Lanka, given that um, there is discontent among the public, among the citizenry? Well, I think people want to have a voice in their own country. They want good governance. They want changes. They want systemic changes. This is what we've heard all throughout the past year and a half. And to do that, the government has to have genuine discussions with all stakeholders. Uh, and not just one or two meetings, really involve the discussion, have listening sessions, and then incorporate uh, those views and that feedback. That's important in any democracy. Uh, the United States of America prides itself on having a vibrant free media. In fact, it is uh, enshrined uh, in the First Amendment as well. Uh, it permits uh, information, ideas, um, and opinions without interference, constraint, or prosecution by the government. Um, the media is referred to as the fourth estate um, uh, after uh, it, the executive legislature and judiciary. Um, Several international organizations, uh, including the United Nations, raised concerns about uh, Sri Lanka's shrinking space for dissent, uh, peaceful protests, freedom of expression. What is the importance uh, that the United States attaches to these democratic principles in practice? Well, we're a democracy, and we're not a perfect democracy. We recognize that. But these values that you just mentioned, the freedom of expression, freedom of speech, to be able to voice opinions clearly without any conflict, without any, any um, risk of imprisonment, those are things that are basic to any democracy. And that's why we value it. And as messy as a democracy can get, the values that a democracy can bring to its country people, to its citizens, it's so important. And that's why we talk about it. And we talk about it in Sri Lanka, we talk about it around the world, about enshrining these values and making sure it's practiced and that the risk of losing it is something that we need to be really aware of and keenly attentive to. 
Uh, the United States of America is going into election season just next year. Um, sadly, Sri Lanka hasn't seen elections for a while. The provincial council elections, uh, local government elections, um, have been uh, delayed, postponed. How do you view this? We believe that timely ele elections are important to any democracy. And this is why we understand next year there will be presidential elections. We're also hoping, according to the Constitution, there will also be followed by local elections, uh, parliamentary, provincial elections, all those things that give the people a voice to be able to uh, express their opinion through the ballot box and to be able to choose their leadership. So we hope that the election stays on schedule uh, next year and onwards. And we're looking forward to seeing that free and fair election, that culture of free and fair elections that's been in Sri Lanka for decades continue. Um, Ambassador Chung, holding parliament accountable, having more conscientious policymakers who actually feel the pulse of the people, who work uh, towards the best interests of the people, these are crucial tenets of a democracy. How must the disconnect between the state and the people be bridged, in your opinion? Well, communication can always be improved between legislators and the people. We have this in the United States as, as well. We have many outlets for people to address their congressmen or women and their senators and go to their offices, send letters, send messages, and to have that interactive opportunity. This is why USAID has been supporting the Open Parliamentary Caucus here in Sri Lanka uh, to really help build and foster that communication at the ground level, at the grassroots level between the voters, the people, and their leadership. And just this week, we've uh, sponsored a group of parliamentarians to go to Washington to learn about how the U.S. Congress works. Uh, last month, we sponsored the Women's Caucus to go to New Zealand, another democracy, to see how the Women's Caucus and women parliamentarians uh, enact bills regarding gender equality and other issues there. The more that we share these kinds of best uh, practices and ideas, I think we can learn from each other. And that's why that communication piece, listening to the needs of the people, taking that feedback and making sure that's integrated into decision making is so important. Ambassador Chung, on the same line of questioning, uh, it's of pivotal importance that Sri Lanka ensures that parliamentarians are cognizant of the sacred role they play mm -hmm. in charting the country's course. They have to be mindful of it mm -hmm. and they have to be aware and um, educated of their rights and responsibilities towards the country's citizenry. Where, when the, this is not happening for the most part, what do we do? Well, I think it's important for parliamentarians, for the government of all branches, just like in our government, to listen, to truly listen to its people. Um, sometimes it feels like there's a distance, there's a gap between the leadership uh, of the various branches of government and the people on the ground. And so this is why we foster that dialogue uh, between uh, the Sri Lankan voters and its people and its leadership in parliament. We've done that through the Open Parliamentary Caucus. We've encouraged more of that discussion ongoing. We've supported the media center in parliament to build capacity to be able to communicate uh, the sessions that are going on within parliament and be able to broadcast that to the public. These are some of the tools and ways that parliament can better hear from directly and respond to its people. You have uh, continuously advocated for the importance uh, of championing a healthy political culture in Sri Lanka that is geared towards accountability and transparency. Uh, Ambassador Chung, rights are interrelated, interdependent, and one right can't trump another right. Um, my question to you is, will the United States of America continue to support Sri Lanka's economic recovery if democratic norms such as holding of timely elections, pr protecting of freedom of expression are not ensured and upheld. We will support the people of Sri Lanka through thick and thin, through the decades, through the 75 years of a relationship that we've had and for the years to come. We do believe that democratic governance and economic governance do go hand in hand. So we will then continue to encourage the government at all levels to make sure that just as they are ambitious about the economic reforms and governance that they are currently on the path to really establishing and implementing, that they're just as ambitious about safeguarding democratic rights. I think both are truly important and they go hand in hand. 
Ambassador Chung, what opportunities do you see in collaborations between the two countries in terms of tourism? I think so much of Sri Lanka's economy is based on tourism and to increasing that tourism, and that's why we're committed to helping that. Of course, we want more tourists from the United States as well, but from everywhere around the world. Just recently, USCID helped uh, sponsor a group of bloggers and uh, influencers from around the world, from all over Europe, India, and the United States, to get them on a tour around Sri Lanka and help them promote Sri Lanka as a tourism destination and to make it fresh and exciting for new tourists as well as returning tourists who've come here once before but want to come back to experience more of Sri Lanka. In addition, USCID, in partnership with the EU, sponsored the Pico Trail, 300-kilometer mile trail through the uh, upcountry Tamil uh, upcountry areas. And in that hill country areas, that Pico Trail will help bring in tourism so that tourists can not only hike and enjoy the nature, but as they're hiking, stop and at stop at temples, stop to look at nature, mm -hmm. and there are markers along the way uh, with QR codes that show exactly the location and the history of that trail. And I was able to climb and hike a part of that trail, uh, and we're happy to see that that's already being uh, recognized. It's being uh, receiving awards, and tourists are recognizing that that is a wonderful way to enjoy Sri Lanka in a new and different way. Public perception and public opinion plays a significant role in um, shaping international relations. How does the U.S. engage with the Sri Lankan media to shape and manage its image um, across the world? I think it's important for us to be authentic and to genuine, be genuine and to communicate uh, what the U.S. is doing, what we aspire uh, in terms of our relationship, what we want to do, do to strengthen our relationship with Sri Lanka, through all media, and that's through our social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter, and even Instagram, um, talking to journalists, talking to media, talking to people from all walks of life. And uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. So we want to make sure people see that, um, the, the facts, the true stories, and be able to hear directly from us. That level of communication is really important to us. As the ambassador representing uh, the interests of one of the world's most powerful players in the backdrop of uh, 75 years in Sri Lanka, uh, how must the two countries go about further cementing its uh, dynamic relationship unperturbed by other powerful players, uh, regional players such as India and China, who are also seeking uh, strategic geopolitical relations uh, with uh, Sri Lanka? Well, Sri Lanka has relationships with many countries around the world and will continue to develop those relationships. What I care about is our bilateral relationship. And I think looking back on the past 75 years, how deep and rich that relationship is, you know, I hear people telling me all the time in the 1960s, they used to receive these USAID biscuits mm -hmm. and they used to visit our American Center on Flower Road to read a book and to watch a movie in, in English. Now, 75 years beyond that, not only are we providing humanitarian assistance, we're providing great tools and capacity building to help the people of Sri Lanka. We've gone from one American Center to four. We have one in Colombo, Matara, Kandy, and Jaffna. And just next week, we're about to open another American center um, up in Batikaloa. So the relationship that's evolved, uh, there's so much potential that goes beyond what we've seen in the past and how we can take it to the future. And that means investing in the young people as well. We have a number of youth forums, youth councils around the country. We held the Youth Summit this year in February in honor of our 75th anniversary. Mm -hmm. We have the Access English Language Program that gives free two-year English language and leadership classes for the underprivileged communities all around the country. These are the ways we really want to help build the relationships. Ambassador Chung, would you say that the U.S. has developed a greater uh, interest in this region and in Sri Lanka over the recent past? Well, our relationship has been growing and strengthening throughout the years. And as I said previously, uh, there's, it started off with basic um, partnerships and basic uh, exchanges, and now we've built that into so much more. Uh, we've celebrated the 70th year anniversary of the Fulbright program. Over 2,000 students and scholars have come back and forth between the United States and Sri Lanka. And that 70 years of that relationship continues to grow. 
Uh, we're going to have Peace Corps volunteers also coming back next year. There's so much of that relationship that we think both economically um, and uh, in the security realm as well, uh, there's much more potential to grow that in many ways. Ambassador Chung, um, multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral collaboration, consultation, uh, diverse opinion is so important to ensure and enable uh, democracy and a vibrant space. What is the role of the Sri Lankan diaspora in ensuring and enabling this? Well, we really value the role of the Sri Lankan American diaspora. They have come back in droves in recent years. They've come back not only to contribute uh, in education exchanges, we've seen medical help, direct relief, uh, many diaspora groups that have contributed millions of dollars in health facilities and medical donations. Um, recently, I attended an event where a, a cancer, a pediatric cancer center, a palliative center, where the majority of the no donations were raised by Sri Lankan American doctors um, throughout the North America. And these are the many ways that the Sri Lankan American diaspora can be that bridge, that connective bridge. I met a young woman who established a Sri Lankan museum in New York mm -hmm. that really tells a story about the deep culture of Sri Lanka and um, academics between the two uh, countries have exchanged views and research programs. So really the potential is so great and having Sri Lankan Americans come back and also welcome Sri Lankans to the United States and really be that enforcing, reinforcing bridge of people to people ties. And really another thing that during the 75th anniversary that I really recognize was a long standing relationship uh, between not only the diaspora to di diaspora, but people who love Sri Lanka, Americans who really truly have spent time here, want to return and have ties. And recently we had the visit of Senator Chris Van Hollen. Now he was here as a young child when his father was a US ambassador to Sri Lanka mm -hmm. 50 years ago. And he's come back and uh, he brought back so many memories of his time here when his father was ambassador. And now I wonder when my son, who's 11 years old now, when he comes back in 50 years, what kind of Sri Lanka he'll see. And I hope those ties continue to grow beyond my tenure and continue to strengthen between the people of our two countries. Would you say that the future of Sri Lanka-US uh, relations rests firmly in the democratic uh, arena, given that democratic values have been uh, long entrenched in both countries? What is the importance that you attach to democratic norms, values, and principles? We are two democracies, absolutely, United States and Sri Lanka. We value our democratic relationship, our shared democratic values. We support Sri Lanka's long-term prosperity and stability. All that depends on the reforms that are happening now. I think Sri Lanka is at a crossroads from the crisis it went through last year. And as it makes these economic reforms to go towards stronger governance reforms as well. Uh, building that people-to-people -people ties in that climate will be very important for us. Sri Lanka is in the process of setting up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, it already has um, certain other measures in terms of transitional justice, including um, an office of, for reparations, an office on missing persons, and several other ad hoc measures that were taken since 2009. How important is it for redress mechanisms and transitional justice measures to be um, victim and survivor centered, uh, having the trust of victims of the citizens themselves? Well, I've heard from my travels around the country exactly what you speak of. People who want a victim centric approach, people who want answers, mothers of disappeared, uh, from the North and the South who want answers for their past and to be, have that reconciliation to truly have closure. I think the measures the government have taken so far are in initial steps, but any kind of truth and reconciliation, whether it's a mechanism or a commission or a committee, really has to have that victim-centric approach to really listen and be inclusive of all stakeholders. Uh, without that, I think you lose the potential of developing the entire spectrum of all the aspects of society in Sri Lanka 
to address the past, to be able to move forward in a really sustainable way for everybody. Um, Sri Lanka is looking to budget 2024. Um, what's your reaction to the fact that Sri Lanka needs to prioritize education, healthcare in terms of its budgetary allocations, uh, as opposed to the massive amounts spent on uh, and allocated for defense, the presidential secretariat, etc. Well, it is a balance to make sure you address all the major needs, the basic needs of its people in a budget. We go through the same budget process every year in Congress and the White House. So as you discuss uh, these budget priorities, making sure to address the social needs, um, the economic needs of the people who have gone through so much in the past year. I think it's important to make sure to protect uh, the most vulnerable, to make sure the social programs are transparent, that the processes and reforms are, are taking place, and to really be transparent in how to communicate the policies uh, to its people. Now, uh, Sri Lanka is going through the IMF restructuring uh, program, debt restructuring program as well. We hope that there is an equal comparable approach by all creditors. We understand that China has um, pledged to share its Chinese XM um, restructuring proposal with Sri Lanka with the other creditors. So we're all waiting to hear from that. And as soon as that uh, information is shared and we're all on the same level playing field, I think the other creditors will be able to assess that and move forward. So we're looking forward to that discussion ongoing uh, for Sri Lanka to move forward with the IMF restructuring and then be able to address some of its macroeconomic uh, policies and governance issues of the past. Uh, and much progress has been made thus far, but to continue on that path. I think it's important not to quit at this juncture. I compare it to having taken antibiotics. You can't quit after two days of being sick and say, I feel better, no more medicine. Mm -hmm. Then the sickness will come back. And it's important to finish, completely finish a comprehensive dose of antibiotics. So in that similar way, I think it's important to continue on the strong structural reforms that address good governance, transparency, anti-corruption, and to really make Sri Lanka well, not only well, but really be healthy and prosper. Ambassador Chung, in the backdrop of marking 75 years of diplomatic uh, relations between Sri Lanka and the United States of America, what message do you have for the people of Sri Lanka? Well, we really cherish this relationship. We think Sri Lanka has so much potential, so much to offer, not only between us as bilateral countries, but in the region and the world. I've always said Sri Lanka punches above its weight in the Indo-Pacific. There is so much that the Sri Lankan people have in terms of being able to offer to the rest of the world. So as we look at the past, not only have we looked at what we've done together, trade-wise, economic-wise, investment-wise, in the security realm, we have provided three Coast Guard cutters to Sri Lanka that have helped combat drug smuggling and hum human smuggling. We've also helped build up the SMEs, women's entrepreneurship, help vocational training, English training. We want to make Sri Lanka strong and be a strong partner and friend for the years to come. And that's my message, that I'm here very humbly as the U.S. Ambassador to Sri Lanka and to tell this story of, of the positive trajectory, the positive trajectory of our relationship, and there is a lot of potential to come. And just as today's DFC announcement that indicates a signal that DFC is not only here to catalyze private sector investment and to believe in the future of Sri Lanka, we're here now, we're here tomorrow, and we're now waiting to see how things turn out. We want to be an active part of the solutions, an active part of the strengthening of Sri Lanka and our bilateral relationship. All right, fantastic. Ambassador Julie Chung, thank you very much thank for you. your time and your perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching us. Good night.